Hi, I'm Blake Crouch, author of the Wayward Pines trilogy, Dark Matter and Recursion. I'm Jackie ben Zachary, a developmental editor who works with Blake, and I'm also his partner. And uh, we're here today to answer some questions that we've been taking on Facebook uh, with regards to Blake's books, Recursion, Dark Matter, but we'll also talk about, you know, Wayward Pines, we'll talk about Abandoned and previous books as well. Um, as a side note, we do this Q and A's on your Facebook probably every other week. So if you're bored in quarantine and you want to stop by and ask him some questions, please do. Yeah, please do. All right. So our first question comes from Jeffrey. Dark Matter is probably my favorite book of all time. That's very nice. In your eyes, what happened to Amanda? Uh, she decided to leave Jason about halfway through the story. How do you think that she ended up? <laughs> Uh, this is the most popular question I get with regards to Dark Matter. Everyone wants to know what happened to Amanda. Um, and the truth is, I don't know. Um, I imagine that she went somewhere beautiful and maybe a place that feels slightly in the future. Um, a, a society of um, a slightly advanced technology. Just but mainly a place where she sort of found her home. Um, but I don't have any specifics yet. When I finish a book, um, I often never return to it in my own mind. Uh, I, I've just, I've said everything I can say, and I kind of like to leave in the endings open-ended so my audience can sort of continue the story for themselves. Um, do you think there's any chance that Leighton or any of the other Jasons would come after her? Oh, I think it's highly likely. Yeah. So if she may <clears throat> have found a nice happy place, but rather not that was... It's not for, it, probably not for long. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's awesome. Uh, as an aside also, you almost cut Amanda completely out of the book. I did. Uh, she was the hardest character to get uh, right in that book. She was, um, a lot of my early readers found her highly annoying. Um, they were like, oh, she's just needy. Why is she here? What is she adding? Uh, so I, I just remember going through draft after draft of trying to get Amanda's character really dialed in. It was a challenge. Well, fans love her because you get this question all the time. So. Well, she does just disappear and not come back. Yeah, she <laughs> exits stage left. She right? does. <laughs> uh, the next question is from Vladimir. Uh, you went full-on sci-fi <clears throat> in Dark Matter and Recursion. Are you planning future work um, that is more in that direction? Um, great question. M my next novel will definitely be in the vein of uh, Dark Matter and Recursion. Sci-fi heavy uh, character development, big emotion. Beyond my next book, um, you know, I don't know. I, I wouldn't mind getting away from the big scientific ideas and exploring uh, more of a straight thriller. I don't know what exactly that means yet, but it's in the back of my mind and uh, we'll see what happens. All right, um, so the next question is from Aubrey. She would like to know if you could talk a bit about your creative process, like how do you start getting your ideas? Do they develop over time? Is it like a flash? Do you, do you find instantly that you know what you're working on? How does that work? Well, sadly, it's never in a flash. Um, <clears throat> it is tragically very slow. Um, typically, a, a book will start with a very just general notion or a question. For instance, with recursion, it started with um, the question, like, what is more powerful than our memories? And I couldn't think of anything. Um, and that set me down this path of researching everything that was happening with human memory in this moment, um, finding out what, what are scientists, what do we understand about the way he, the, our brains form memories, uh, what is still undiscovered country. And once I have the general concept and I know I want to you know, circle my book around like this topic, then I started thinking about plot. And oddly, character comes at the end the characters sort of emerge from the situation and the world uh, I, I build for them. And it takes multiple drafts to, it, to finally get the characters right. In fact, I think it's the character work that I do most uh, in, in the final drafts. Uh, do you find, so you often start with what you're describing as not completely formed characters and that they form over time. Do they ever change the plot because of their, who they are? Oh, sure. Um, very often, uh, as I really come to understand a character, the the plot will change to meet their actions. For instance, Helena, um, I kind of only discovered towards the end of Recursion that 
the thing that was driving Helena to create this memory chair in the first place was that her mom had Alzheimer's. Uh, and this gave her a, a kind of, it revitalized her motivation for me. And it really gave her a heightened sense of purpose. And suddenly I understood what she was doing. Where before, in earlier drafts, I liked her a lot as a character, but I just didn't, I didn't really understand why she was doing what she was doing, why she had dedicated her life to um, this single-minded drive to you know, unlock the mysteries of human memory. And once I locked that final piece in, then I understood everything about her. But, and also though the concept of um, Alzheimer's being, and its effect on people is actually a personal one for you, right? It is. My uh, grandfather on my mom's side had Alzheimer's and he came to live with us <clears throat> when I was really young, I was eight or nine. He came to live with us for about six weeks. Uh, and it was just a really uh, kind of sad and uh, honestly a traumatic time. Because ne I was young and I'd never seen anyone whose like, memory and identity was leaving them. Um, and it just stuck with me. And I, I don't know, that's the, one of the weird things about writing is you never know what um, you know, past event will resurface in a new book. Hmm. Um, let's see the next question is from Campanero. Uh, she's read all of your books. Can you suggest other books that she should be reading, especially now that we're all home more yeah. <laughs> and maybe have slightly more time to read? Sure. Hi, Campanero. Um, I would dive into the short fiction of Ted Chiang, Exhalation, uh, Stories of Your Life, two, two fantastic collections. Um, of course, Michael Crichton, if you haven't read him, uh, just you know, one of the greatest sci-fi writers of our time. Um, I love uh, Amor Toll's novels, uh, Rules of Civility and A Gentleman in Moscow. Um, what am I forgetting? What, what have you read lately that you're loving? Um, I worked on a book last year that came out, Emily Eternal, that you had developed. Oh, by Mark Wheaton. Of, yeah, Angie Wheaton. And that was a, that's a really fun one if you're looking for something that's sci-fi but not like, you know, make yourself crazy hard sci-fi. Yeah. Uh, he's also just a really talented writer. Um, I'm listening a lot to uh, the Revisionist History podcast, mm. which has been really cool. I am uh, listening right now to a great audiobook called Waystation by Clifford Simak. It's an old 1964 novel. It won the Hugo Award. Um, just beautiful. Um, we also both really love N.K. Jemison. Mm -hmm. um, she's really very talented. Speaking of the Hugo Awards, yeah. wins it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, Veronica Roth has a new book out called Chosen Ones. It's her first uh, dive into adult fiction. It's fantastic. It's like sci-fi and fantasy. Paul Tremblay is an amazing horror novelist. He wrote A Head Full of Ghosts. Um, a collection called uh, Growing Things, which just won the Bram Stoker Award. Um, the work of Andy Weir, the Martian Artemis. That, that should be a lot to Get keep you, you busy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Um, Naomi asks if you have any writing tips, um, especially <clears throat> for those who are, you know, maybe stuck in the middle of something <laughs> difficult to write. Mm. Um, well, first of all, I feel your pain. Naomi, I'm stuck in the middle of something I'm writing right now. Um, you know, just don't be afraid to set it aside for a minute to share it with trusted readers, to get their feedback. Um, one of the things that is frustrating but also is very helpful for me when I'm writing is that, you know, I get sort of stuck in these like grooves of thought and it's sometimes really hard to imagine other ways the plot could go if you've always thought about it in a certain way and that certain way isn't working. Getting other feedback from readers is a really powerful thing. I do it all the time. I have a group of about a dozen people whose opinions I value, and uh, when I get to about the midpoint of the book, I start sharing it with them, and uh, because I can see where it might go through their eyes. It doesn't mean I, I necessarily will take their idea or their advice, but it just it kind of breaks me out of the rut I find myself in. In fact, rarely do you actually take these ideas. It's yeah. more like their creativity inspires your creativity. Correct. Sometimes also just being around other creative things, right? Mm -hmm. Like looking mm -hmm. at art, watching yeah. a great film. Yeah. And, and reading while you're writing. I think reading helps too. One of the things I think is interesting about your process is that you have journals that you start with mm -hmm. and which you literally will. They're like crazy person journals because they're just like one sentence a day, kind of like 
what if cheese could fly and talk, you know, like, um, be <laughs> would we eat it then? That would yes. actually be sad. <laughs> uh, but no, like this idea of like, you're never letting any ideas completely go away mm -hmm. that way you can always come back to them later. Do you mm -hmm. think that that's helpful? It is. Um, I can't tell you how many times I have gone back through my journals, like five years after I've just written a bunch of scrawl down and, and found some little nugget of something that became a book or became a short story. Uh, let's see here. The next one is um, from Tom. Uh, he says that he loves how Wayward Pines ended, but not everyone is completely satisfied with how The Last Town ended. Uh, do you have any plans to continue to write in that series or to extend Ethan's story? I don't have any plans at the moment. Uh, I, I think the last line of uh, the Wayward Pines trilogy is, is my favorite way I've ever ended a book. I, I think the fact that people talk about it a lot means I did it right. I want I don't want my endings to just be this massive, ni nicely tied up in a bow. I, I want them to be provocative and, and I want them to have a, an energy that suggests the book could go on even if I'm not writing it. I don't have plans to continue Wayward Pines at this point in time. I, I would never say 100% never because you don't know. But um, I'm more interested in the moment at, uh, of writing new stories and new characters. So in a related question that isn't in here, but is a question that you've gotten quite a bit, is like, um, can you actually explain the ending of Dark Matter, as in why it was important for Jason <coughs> to have Charlie choose the world? Yeah, uh, this is a spoiler alert because I'm going to talk about the end of uh, Dark Matter. Fast forward, fast forward if you haven't seen it, read it. <laughs> but yeah, at the end, I mean, the point of, of that ending was it, it wasn't just Jason anymore choosing like his reality. It, he, it was his entire family all working together to choose the right reality for themselves. And I, I think that was just a, a, an important uh, metaphor for not just the book, but for myself when I was writing it. Do you think that that means that there's no way that they can, that other Jasons can find them? I think other Jasons might be able to find them. Mm, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. yeah. In, but do you have any plans to continue Dark Matter then? Not in the novel format. Mm, interesting. All right. Uh, what are the top, th uh, this comes from Chris. He wants to know what are the top three books you have read in the last year or so? Mm, top three books in the last year. I know, you just said, gave company a list of books to read. Yeah. Um, ooh. Uh, the collection of short stories by Ted Chang called Exhalation. Um, I read, and I'm gonna, I cannot think of the author's name at the moment, but Never Let Me Go. Hmm. Very famous book. Um, it was published in 2002. I do know that. Um, and I really liked Veronica Roth's Chosen Ones. There's a book coming out soon, too, that you really loved. Oh, that's right. I'm glad you remembered. Um, Max Brooks, the author of World War Z, is publishing a new novel. I think they pushed it out a month to June. It's called Devolution, and it is the uh, Bigfoot novel that you did not know you needed in your life. But you did need, right? You totally Do need, need it. it. Yeah. Uh, one of the hard things I think about being in the industry, authors, <clears throat> I mean, fans write in a lot to you asking mm -hmm. for ideas, for books to read, or what have you read that you've loved lately. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times, you're reading books a year or so before they come out, which yeah. is probably makes these lists a little confusing. Yes. <laughs> From time to time, you're like, wait, what has actually come out? Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Um, so uh, Dario asks, what is your preferred method of writing? Do you like typing on a computer or using a pen and paper? Do you ever use a voice recorder? No. Like, what kinds of technology do you prefer? Mm -hmm. Maybe Luddite style yeah. styles of writing? Um, the books start with thoughts uh, that then get written down into journals. Uh, the ultimate technology. The ultimate technology, <laughs> thinking. <laughs> um, I, I write in, in Word, um, but during the process, I'll often um, like take a, my voice app on my iPhone and, and read in, back what I've written for the day and, and then listen to it like the following day just to hear the words and sentences um, experience them in a different context because you know just reading the same sentence over and over again uh, in a word document you start to lose a little objectivity and sometimes if you can hear yourself reading it you can hear what's working and what's not working um, in a way that kind of escapes you if you're just reading it on a computer screen there's actually a really famous editor who uh, would used to call 
authors in and have them read their books out loud to her when she was doing workshops with them. Really? Yeah, and she'd say, now you know everything you need to fix. <laughs> it's true. Um, and that's actually yeah. advice I've given writers too, is like, you know, just read it out loud. You'll <laughs> hear pretty quickly what works and what doesn't Especially work. in dialogue. Um, one of the other things that I think is really interesting about your process is also, you know, um, where you're writing. Because mm -hmm. frequently with, uh, between work travel, personal travel, having three children, mm -hmm. having, you know, a rambunctious dog and social life, you're often writing for five minutes in the car somewhere mm -hmm. or 20 minutes on an airplane. Like, mm -hmm. um, do you find that technology is necessary to, I mean, have you crafted, I guess, what you use around that sort of haphazardy process? I mean, a little bit. It, it's not a, it's not an ideal, uh, situation to write in, but it's what it is. Uh, I love writing on planes. I get more work done on planes than anywhere else. I think it's all the white noise and the lack of uh, internet connection. Um, you know, it, if I look back at the way I write books, um, you know, a, a novel takes about a year and a half for me to finish. But it's if you condensed all the actual writing time, I'm probably writing it in four months. Um, the other 14 months is thinking about it and making missteps and having to redo it or you know, just trying to find those moments to write. Being distracted. Being distracted, yeah. <laughs> totally. Um, okay. Uh, Heather asks, does the science and technology spark the story and characters, or do you have story ideas and look for science and technology to support it? It's mm, a good question, Heather. Um, lately, I would say going back, at least beginning with Dark Matter, Recursion, and Summer Frost, the science sparked the story. Uh, in other words, I'm like I take a bunch of uh, magazines like Scientific American, in nature, and I'm always scouring the internet for, um, you know, just like what is the cool technology that's emerging that we haven't really heard of, um, like 4D printing. Like that's crazy to think about it, but it's real. So I'm looking for the stuff like that, and once I latch onto something that I think is really powerful and unique, um, then I start asking myself, how could I maybe build a plot around it? And if I start seeing inroads, then I think, well, what are, what are the characters doing in? in in this plot and and then a book starts to come together uh would you say that that's the case with all of your books like summer frost was actually <clears throat> a little bit of the reverse mm -hmm. of all of that right how so well it was like it used to be the beginning of dark matter right that's true but no it used to be the beginning of <laughs> cedar incense recursion recursion that's right it used to be the mm -hmm. beginning of recursion my apologies and then it was thrown away mm -hmm. and then it was resurrected let's yes yeah, summer frost is an interesting uh, anomaly because um, I had written 160 pages of the follow-up to Dark Matter and there was parts of it I really liked but it just wasn't really coming together and I, you know it's a story about AI and about con the emergence of um, artificial consciousness and I just didn't feel like I really had the story and I wasn't ready to tell it yet so I set it aside and I thought I'd wasted all that time I went off and I wrote Recursion and then after recursion, being away from those pages for about a year and a half, I just suddenly saw the story in a brand new light. Now, sadly, none of those pages could be used, but um, I, I, I took a lot of inspiration from them and, and dashed off Summer Frost pretty quickly. But I also think that knowing that, you know, because I knew that from the beginning, to me, the connective tissue thematically between those two, not necessarily characters, but like on the deeper level of what is the mind, what is consciousness, what makes somebody human, mm -hmm. is pure mind just as human as being biologically human? Like those questions that you ask in there are very related to the questions in recursion, which are like, what is, what is being in the moment? What is time? What is mm -hmm. being alive? You know, which I think is really, you know, if you haven't read Summer Frost or Recursion, you've read one or the other, you should really read them t back to back mm -hmm. because I think that they kind of, thematically complement. Yeah, they're all asking about identity and reality and just the nature of like who we are in, in this weird universe. Um, okay, the next one is going in a very different direction. So Amy would like to know if you will ever write another Luther Kite story <laughs> and will you ever move back to North Carolina? <laughs> Random. Um, so Luther Kite is a villain. It's probably the nastiest villain I've ever written. And he was in my... Uh, very first novel, Desert Places, and the follow-up, Locked Doors. Um, I was at a very different point in my career uh, when I wrote those books. I mean, that was, gosh, 15 or 16 years ago. Um, there's no science fiction in those books. Some would say there's no humanity in those books. <laughs> um, I still love them. They're very dark. They're horror uh, thrillers. 
Um, but I'm just in a very different place now. I, I don't think I would return to uh, Andy Thomas or Luther Kite, although I am proud of those books and they launched me into the career I have now, just in a very different place. Uh, I love North Carolina. I don't know if I would move back. Um, I really love the mountains. I grew up in the foothills in the Piedmont of North Carolina. Love Asheville. I love Blowing Rock and Boone, and I love the coast. Um, I don't know. Never say never. But you like you also live in mountains now. I do. I live in <laughs> big mountains now. I live in Colorado uh, at 7,000 feet, and uh, I, I in, the, in the mountains and very near the desert, so I, I love it too. Hmm. Uh, let's see here. Um, the next one is from Matt. Has the current pandemic and general global climate influenced your writing recently? Hmm. Um, well, I think the obvious answer is yes, it influences everything. Um, I don't think that I will come out of this and like write a pandemic story. I don't think it's influencing my writing in that way. I think what it's doing is um, it's shedding some new light on the kinds of characters I write anyway. I write characters who are in extraordinary, extreme situations, kind of dealing with the unimaginable. And, you know, luckily, up until now, I've only had to imagine what it's like to be one of those characters. Um, living in a pandemic quarantine situation where you don't know how long this is going to last, if the economy is going to come back or be destroyed, if you're going to get sick or if loved ones are going to get sick, it just makes it all much more personal and real. I find a lot of realizations coming to me that uh, I wish I had had to use in books. For instance, I, I just think the emotional roller coaster of this moment is is really fascinating. Like there are moments where it feels um, like this is just a little blip, and we're going to be over this in a month, and then we'll go back to normal, and you know we'll look back on this and just think, wow, that was a weird time. And then there are other moments where it feels like is this. The beginning of the end and not knowing which reality to start adapting to um, is really disorienting and it's something that I could not have articulated in a character before now um, because I had not lived through it. Um, in the book that you are working on now you actually have a scene in the beginning this isn't gonna spoil anything where there are grocery stores mm -hmm. that are without food mm -hmm. which is sort of very interesting that literally four months after you write yeah. that we're living through stuff like that has it changed yeah. any any even just like small details I know you said it changed the way mm -hmm. you're thinking of this character but anything else about your current writing um, it's just giving me more of a, a sense of how the world reacts in a time of incredible uncertainty and incredible death tolls. Like if you know someone were to say, hey, we're going to lose almost 5,000 Americans a day for a while because of a disease. Um, someone had told us that like six months ago. I think we'd be like, wow, how do you ever adjust to that? But it's kind of horrifying how quickly we come to terms with accepting this new like horrifying reality we're hmm. in. That is yeah. interesting. Um, one of the questions that I have, just like editor, writer, is, is there anything about your writing in, that you've done previously that today you would like to redo or change or that you would do <laughs> differently now? No, um, no. I, I don't think that you can revisionist history, like your career <laughs> or uh, choices you've made. I mean, I've kind of written books literally built around that uh, premise. I think the mistakes you make uh, and the good choices you make both work together to define you. So you can't go back and selectively edit or take away things you've done that you shouldn't have done. Like that, they make you who you are, and they give you like some depth. What would you say is the best scene that you've ever written, or your favorite thing that you've written? Hmm. Uh, a couple come to mind. I, I really like the scene with um, D and Jack and Run when they reunite in uh, Missoula, Montana, mm -hmm. and under incredibly. Uh, wait, it's not Missoula. It's. Uh, boy, it's been a while since I've done this book. I think we'll it's in Montana. Probably. It's in Montana, probably. <laughs> um, it's in one of the big cities in Montana. Uh, I, I really am proud of that scene. I, I, it still sticks with me. Um, and there's some stuff in uh, in Dark Matter, uh, like when Jason one goes and spends that weekend with Daniela too. I think that's a. Really, I, I'm really proud of that scene. Hmm. All right. So the last question from fans is from Todd. What are you working on now, and when can we expect it? Hmm. Uh, I'm working on my next novel. Um, about halfway through it. Um, it is very much in the vein of Dark Matter and Recursion, a sci-fi thriller. I'm hoping it's out in 2021. Could be early 2022. Just, you know, everything is so in flux right now, uh, this virus. So, you know, we'll, 
I, I want to roll this book out at the right time and I don't want to rush the story. So in the next year or two. Excellent. Well, that's all we have. Uh, stay safe out there, everyone. These are crazy, extraordinary times. Stay in if you can. Stay safe, stay healthy, help each other, help yourself. Uh, binge watch great TV and of course, uh, binge read a lot of books. Thank you. Thank you.